My name is Steve Ludwig. I want to thank the uh, Seattle Science Foundation for allowing us to participate in this tonight's educational event. Um, we're going to um, start um, with a discussion on pelvic fixation. That seems to be a newer, hotter topic today. We have a bunch of uh, panelists and our fellows that are going to bring us through an overview of pelvic fixation, as well as um, as well as some case examples uh, where we thought pelvic fixation would be indicated. So, cool. If you can put it into presenter mode, that would be great. And go on to the next slide, please. And I think you can keep going through through these slides and go to our first slide just so we can get things started. So if we can just back up so everybody knows who we're talking about. Um, um, today, Dr. Ko, Kavanaugh, and Tortolani were involved in, in helping get the presentations and the cases together. And then the next slide, please, are our current uh, fellows. Dr. Lockheed, Dr. Patel, and Dr. Weimreb, um, who will be discussing three interesting cases that we can talk about. And our research fellows were very helpful, uh, Tyler Pease and Ryan Smith, in, in helping us with this presentation tonight. Um, with that said, let's look at our agenda. Um, I'll give a, a very brief overview on um, some of the state of pelvic fixation, looking at some techniques and how our group has modified the techniques, employing some minimally invasive options. Uh, Steve Lockie will then move on and give a talk where pelvic fixation came into play with regards to trauma. Akul Patel uh, will then uh, provide a case uh, looking at <clears throat> spinal deformity and how we employed pelvic fixation and the benefits there. And we'll conclude with um, Dr. Weinreb talking about uh, if there's a role for pelvic fixation in degenerative lumbar conditions. So once again, I want to thank um, Rick and Izzy and the rest of Seattle Foundation tonight to, uh, to give us the opportunity to talk and present. Um, and let's move forward with some a uh, uh, little brief, a little bit of a brief overview. Next slide, please. So I think at the end of the day, um, what we'd like from everybody in terms of takeaway points from tonight's discussion of the cases is to really understand the clinical issues uh, that are involved with favoring um, pelvic fixation. Secondly, we want to have everybody understand the, the technical constraints of the different techniques of performing pelvic fixation. Um, to really understand that with all the pros involved with pelvic fixation, there's gotta be some downsides and we'll go over some of the brief downsides of the pelvic fixation. Um, and then lastly, through case examples, we'd like to review the more common clinical scenarios for performing pelvic fixation. Next slide, please. So the rationale, why do we even do it, right? It's very clear uh, to people that do spine surgery that going to the pelvis clearly enhances the rigidity and the biomechanical stability of your construct, right? You're able to better not only obtain, but also maintain the correction of the spinal deformity. And by plugging into the pelvis, by improving the mechanics across the lumbosacral zone, it should in theory reduce the risk of having a non-union and pseudoarthrosis which can be quite critical uh, with regards to long spinal deformities, however you define that uh, to the sacrum. Additionally, going to the pelvis in those degenerative conditions of the spine can potentially prevent, if you could do a risk stratification and understand who's at risk, and we'll uh, talk about some of the risks associated with that through case examples, of the prevention of an absolutely horrendous complication that uh, at least we see uh, time to time in Maryland of a sacral fracture if you plug into the sacrum um, and patients come back with progressive, severe, intolerable pain in their buttock area and, and recurrent radiculopathy. Uh, next slide, please. 
So there's no question there, there's so much literature out there that if you plug into the pelvis and you're fusing to the sacrum, that it definitely will reduce your risk of having a pseudarthrosis. The evidence is, is fairly significant in your favor, right? We know that in long deformities, that's true. And we also know with shorter lumbosacral fusions, there are some risks, uh, or excuse me, some benefit of going to the pelvis, but with the expense of having problems with the prominence of the iliac screw fixation. And in certain studies, that risk can be up to 30%. Go to the next slide. And that's really with response to um, um, a little bit more of the legacy techniques that we'll go in through. Um, there's not only a greater dissection of going to the pelvis that's associated with a greater EBL, greater surgical site infections. There could be hardware issues. Um, a lot of the legacy techniques associated with the high risk of requiring pelvic screw or offset connectors uh, being removed from the construct are with those the prominence of the hardware and the lateral offset connectors. And with some of the newer, more modern day S2AI techniques that we'll talk about, you clearly can violate the joint and there can be associated pain associated with the SI joint being violated. Next slide, please. A lot of the older data that suggests that the pelvic hardware was prominent, symptomatic, problematic, was with regards to the use of these iliac screws with lateral offset connectors. And that created a clinical conundrum for a lot of our patients. Next slide, please. With time, the S2 AI screw evolved, which was a lower profile, was in line with the rest of your thoracolumbar hardware, uh, which is important for the ease of hooking up uh, to your pelvic screw. And we know the biomechanics, when tested and compared to the more traditional uh, pelvic screw with an offset connector, yielded fairly similar mechanical stability. Next slide. We know with the S2AI, when you look at Joe O'Brien's original work, there was approximately 60% of those screws that violated the, the SI joint. And whether or not in certain studies that was a causative factor of late pain really is questionable. There are other studies that suggest that with this technique, we know that mechanically it was similar to the traditional um, lateral offset iliac bolt technique, but there were fewer returned revision surgeries related to wound problems. There was reduced risk of having that implant loosening. And we knew that there was a decreased risk of having late pain in certain uh, data sets. Next slide, please. We know that violating the joint, the SI joint, in a certain cohort of patients can be, can be significant for persistent symptomatic pain. With some of our experience with MIS techniques and trauma, a technique evolved where we avoided the SI joint and the S2AI screw. And you can see here, and you can go through some of the next slides are cool. Um, and we can avoid the S2AI starting point and go above that, above the joint, not violate the joint to hopefully avoid some of the SI joint discomfort and pain. Next slide. And you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> We published this, or, or this is uh, this information is in publication. You can go to the next slide so we can get into some of the granularity of the details of the study. We looked at 57 patients with this modified above the SI joint technique in, in a predominance of scoliosis patients. And you can keep clipping through these data sets. Go to the next slide, cool. And when we looked at our return to the operating room and failure of lumbopelvic fixation. With our technique, we had 24% of the screws either breaking, the shanks breaking, the set screws pulling out, or the rod members pulling out from the screws, a variety of different failure mechanisms 
but only a 1% failure rate requiring surgical correction. So I think that's important. So although the lumbopelvic fixation with this modified iliac starting point above the SI joint was there, we had a high failure rate. Go to the next slide. When you look at our correction in the failed patients of lumbopelvic screws versus the non-failed ones, there was no real difference in radiographic corrections of their spinal deformity, despite having failure of the fixation in the pelvic region. Go to the next slide. So despite having a high failure rate of 24%, it really didn't correlate clinically of those patients, nor radiographically losing their correction or maintenance of their correction or requiring revision. And compared to other more traditional type of pelvic fixation, uh, although showing a higher rate of failure in some patients, uh, with those associated techniques, it required a higher revision rate in other series. So the data is sort of back and forth. You can go to the next slide. So some of the take home messages before we move on to, to some of the clinical examples are obviously it's complex going to the sacrum and getting a, a solid biological fusion. We believe that in larger constructs, deformity corrections, tom trauma, um, corrections with low lumbar burst fractures, lumbosacro, sacro-pelvic dissociations that <clears throat> going to the pelvis can protect the sacrum and achieve a biological fusion. Whether or not there is a role for an SI joint fusion is yet to be determined. I think it's, it's an interesting premise. We know there's a certain percentage of patients uh, where we're violating the SI joint that have continuation of pain. And whether or not an SI joint fusion mitigates some of this risk is questionable. Whether or not in our modified iliac technique, uh, whether or not we would have the high rate of lumbopelvic fixation failure uh, that would be reduced with a concomitant SI joint fusion, once again, unknown, but an interesting thought. Next slide, please. When you look at the mechanics and the biomechanics, and this is sort of off the press um, from about a year ago, and you can go to the next slide, there's no question that when you add an SI joint fusion with longer fusions to the sacrum, it definitely increases mechanically the pelvic stability. Whether or not there's a clinical meaning, meaningful clinical outcome yet to be determined. Next slide, please. So lastly, there, there needs to be options. You can keep clicking through this, a cool. Um, with the transverse connector, there's more prominence, there's more surgical site infections, EBL, uh, and problems with wound healing. Um, with regards to, you can keep clicking through that, Akul. Um, there may be problems with S2 AI screws with crossing a joint, causing pain, requiring more SI joint fusions. I don't know the answer to which technique. I think you need to understand, you can go to the next slide, that under a multitude of different clinical scenarios, you need to understand that you can keep clicking through this that there may be a role for an S2 AI screw, there may be a role for this modified pelvic fixation, and there may be a role in a clinical scenario where you need to have an iliac uh, screw with a transverse offset connector uh, to, get, to get the job done. So I think understanding that there's a variety of techniques um, that you have in your clinical armamentarium and surgical armamentarium, when they may be applicable and when uh, and a concomitant SI joint fusion um, uh, may be a potential option uh, is important to consider. Um, so with that said, why don't we go through a couple of case examples? Uh, Steve, why don't you start with your trauma case? Great. Thank you, Dr. Ludwig, and thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I when I think about uh, reasons to instrument the pelvis in trauma, at least you know, broadly speaking, there are of course uh, exceptions and additions. But uh, anybody who has lumbopelvic uh, dissociation or sacral pelvic dissociation, just because of how unstable those injuries are, 
And then patients with low lumbar fractures that are unstable, achieving that fixation of the pelvis is really going to add uh, the rigidity necessary to the construct to maintain alignment and healing. So we have a case here to sort of illustrate those examples. This is a 52-year-old male was in a high energy uh, uh, injury, has a multitude of uh, injuries. He's polytraumatized. We were initially consulted for T11 and T12 compression fractures. Unfortunately, he had a little bit more going on than that. You can go to the next slide. His past medical history was really unremarkable. And in, uh, in physical exam, uh, uh, at the time, uh, he, was, he was intoxicated, but he was neurologically grossly intact. And importantly, his rectal tone, perianal and sensation was intact, and he was not in spinal shock. Next. This is a CT scan. You can see right away on the sagittal views, uh, there's a sacral fracture. Turns out this is an H-type sacral fracture, so the sacral pelvic dissociation. Uh, other important point I just want to highlight on the right-hand side as we scroll through the axials, you'll notice there's an L5 lamina fracture, which extends pretty far down uh, towards the facet joint. So there's really concern for both a sacral pelvic dissociation and a lumbopelvic dissociation in this particular patient. So highly unstable, quite fortunate for, for him that he didn't have any neurologic deficits associated with this. And so, you know, uh, just breaking this down and how do you approach it surgically? And what's the right, right choice for this patient? I think right away, what comes to mind, somebody's polytraumatized, maybe not adequately resuscitated uh, in the immediate uh, setting after the injury. Um, there's obviously going to be a lot of soft tissue damage in this area. If you can achieve this with percutaneous fixation, it's really beneficial uh, for the patient. So if we could go to the next slide. So that's what we chose to do. Uh, this is the demonstrating the, the K-wire technique uh, after we've plast our, our jam sheeting needles. Uh, the patient didn't have particularly good bone qualities, and so the decision was made to, to instrument up to L4 in this case. We can go to the next slide. Um, this is the lateral view, again, demonstrating safe placements of our K-wires. Really the trick for these, uh, even though this isn't a perk talk, is having the K-wire uh, within the body before it crosses the medial uh, wall of the pedicle on your AP view. Uh, we, uh, we, we like to confirm this just to ensure uh, a consistent safe placement of all of our, our screws when we do this percutaneously. Next slide. Uh, the obturator outlet view or the teardrop view, view that we use for placing our, our pelvic fixation, uh, we, we've passed our K-wire here. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, and when you confirm placement, you want it in that dense bony corridor it is both outside the hip joint and above the, the sciatic notch. So you can get an obturator or excuse me, an iliac outlet view and a lateral, which again demonstrates here that we've got great fixation uh, anterior to the osteoligamentous uh, pivot point on the superior end plate of, of S1, which is gonna add a lot of stability to this region. Um, we've got safe placement of all of our instrumentation, both outside the hip joint and north of the sciatic notch. And if you go to the next slide, these are our fluoro views. Uh, after we passed our rods. Um, and then finally, in our next slide, uh, the post-operative radiographs would show uh, excellent alignment uh, of, of our fracture and, and really a, a great construct that's done entirely percutaneously. Um, and so for this patient, if you go to the next slide, ended up doing uh, quite well. His neurologic status was normal once he was finally uh, no longer intoxicated. Uh, he remained intact for the duration of his admission, uh, ended up getting discharged and uh, didn't develop any wound complications. So it's a real win. So Steve, maybe we can go back. Um, I think that's the last slide, correct? Correct. So maybe we can go back to here. So this is, this is a U-type sacral fracture, just in summary, in a patient that's polytraumatized that's neurologically intact, that also has a concern, as you pointed out astutely, um, for having not only sacropelvic dissociation with the U-type, but also a lumbopelvic dissociation with the flexion distraction injury. Um, I think in the face of somebody with poor bone quality based on their Hounsfield units that we use in trauma, looking at the CT scan as a surrogate for sort of a poor man's DEXA scan that we can't get any other information about their, their bone equality. Um, historically, um, we would open these, these fractures, probably 10, 15 years ago, we would open these fractures and we had a miserable problem with infection issues, a miserable problem um, with bleeding, transfusion requirements, 
uh, it was a big hit to an already polytraumatized patient. So the emergence of some of the techniques we've learned through degenerative minimal access surgery really, really was helpful. I think some of the issues regarding these complex sacral fractures where we're getting pelvic fixation are um, sort of deform, how do you correct the deformity, right? We correct them based upon patient positioning, right? Number one, sometimes we have to put patients into bifemoral traction to get them reduced, um, bring their legs all the way up. Um, sometimes with compression distraction techniques, we could help realign the sacrum as well. Um, and sometimes we can also do a minimal access open technique where we can directly manipulate those fracture fragments, but it saves, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot easier to do that through minimal access surgery compared to open surgery. If we know somebody has a neurologic deficit, we'll do sort of a hybrid technique where we'll do a direct decompression or a sacral laminectomy and decompression through a centralized incision, and then we'll perk everything else. If we believe that um, the patient requires a fusion uh, concomitantly, we'll do a fusion approach through a Wiltsy approach. Um, so typically our, our pedicle screw placement or our portals through the minimal axis surgery will give us a nice Wiltsy approach so that we can decorticate the transverse processes in the sacral ala and do a, a posterolateral fusion for these patients um, if we need to get a biological fusion. If they have a true um, lumbosacral dissociation associated with it requiring a fusion, uh, and we believe that there's a greater ligamentous injury than a, a bony injury that won't heal. We often also will um, take these patients and, um, um, and remove, offer removal of hardware if we're not doing a fusion. We'll let the bony elements heal themselves, and in about four to six months, if, if patients come back, and this is a challenging patient population for, for everybody that treats trauma patients, um, to get patients to come back, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll remove, remove that hard, the hardware in about four to six months um, uh, in order to save some of the lumbosacral motion, uh, but allow their, their sacral fracture uh, to heal. I don't know, Eugene, any other thoughts regarding this case? So I think this is a, a powerful tool uh, to do this percutaneous because as you go down and you know try to do these opens and place these screws in, uh, the whole soft tissue envelope is disrupted and, and it's just kind of like a huge kind of mini bomb went off in the soft tissue and they are high complication rates. So doing this percutaneous is a powerful tool. We had a question about, uh, Steve, that appeared on the chat box about doing this via navigation rather than um, through uh, fluoroscopic percutaneous. And just one thought process behind that, I think about eight years ago or 10 years ago, we actually tried all the three navigation systems to do these with uh, navigation-based place pedicle screws percutaneously or um, the iliac bolts uh, through navigation. The only thought process behind that is with navigation, uh, just gotta be careful because these fractal fragments move and your calibration off your navigation can also move and you can actually misplace some of these screws if rely on navigation uh, too much. It's very different than trying to do placement of these fractures in a stable spine but because of the fracture nature, navigation may be off calibrated. So just a word of caution about easy navigation for uh, fracture fixation. Yeah, I think those are good points. I think whatever you have available at your hospital, we have, we have every widget known to mankind at our hospital. We have, um, we have the arrow, you know, that brain lab. I don't, I don't want to popularize any particular manufacturer, but we have different navigation systems and different robotic systems and obviously fluoroscopy. And there, there are issues regarding all those enabling technologies. I think whatever works best in your hands, whatever workflow works best in your hands, um, it's always great to have an O-arm spin, you know, to, to check. I think that was, the, that was one of the questions, you know, to confirm the placement of your, 
of your hardware as well as confirm your reduction. Um, I think that's all great. I think the logistics of, of where we practice, sometimes it's more frustrating bringing that technology in than using fluoroscopy. It's really, really hard, at least in our hands. I know there's problems with fluoro exposure, radiation exposure to the team, to the patient, to us, right? Um, there's a lot of badness. Um, it just seems to, 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 to be more, um, more interference when we, when we begin to use the robot. Um, we've tried it, as, as Eugene pointed out, every which way, um, at least in our hands, uh, we're fairly facile doing it quickest with very little fluoroscopy exposure to, to everybody in the room um, based upon our techniques. So, um, are there any other questions, Eugene, on the panel before we move on to the next case? I don't think we answered it adequately. Hey, hey Jim, can I, can I interfere? This is Jens. So this is beautifully done. And I hear you loud and clear with the uh, woes of open uh, surgery. In our series that we published many moons ago from Harvard, we reported about a 30% hardware failure rate, which was interestingly not symptomatic in these polytrauma patients. Usually the rod would break around the pelvic screws. So um, we found this was not symptomatic. Now, if you just put those in percutaneous and like, we did this open with some bone graft there, is that... Um, going to be the same number if you look at them after two years or what do you expect to happen? You talked about sometimes doing fusions. And if you do that, how do you decide when to do that um, and relative to hardware failure risk? So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jens. Thanks for, for your insight. And I know you guys had a lot of experience at, at Harborview. I mean, we had, when we opened these, just to put in perspective, um, uh, Dan Gelb and I did, did, when we were here 20 years ago, did did probably um, all these cases open. And we had probably close to a 50, five zero percent chance of having a surgical site infection, totally unacceptable, right? We needed a, something else to help us with that. With the evolution of the, the minimally invasive techniques, it really sort of moved this injury pattern along to becoming a, a, a safer procedure, right? Where infection risk went down to probably less than 1% which is very acceptable. Now, with regards to when do we fuse and when don't we fuse, uh, one of our fellows published um, some of our lumbopelvic fixation data. I wanna say in 2015 with three or four year follow-up, no fusions, no fusions. So these were cases of U-type, T-type, lambda-type, transverse-type, H-type sacral fractures, all bony, predominantly sacro-pelvic insufficiency or instability um, with no hardware failure um, or rod fixation failure. I wanna say it's about, it was about two years out provisional data. We haven't pulled those, those cases back to look at more longer term follow-up. When do we decide to fuse? When you have an associated lumbo-pelvic dissociation. So if you had a, um, a sacral fracture, associated with a, um, you know, an L5-S1 facet dissociation, L5-S1 disco ligamentous injury. Those are the patients, Jens, that we are uh, doing the Wilkesy fusion uh, to your point where we'll decorticate and do an inner transverse process fusion uh, in those cases. So you have to have an iteratively higher magnitude of injury and treatment to have a concomitant fusion. Hopefully that, that helps answer the question. Um, when we move on to, to Jens, anything else with regards to that? Does that help? No, thank you. That was very good, very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Um, you wanna move on to uh, Akul, are you presenting the next interesting case? Yes. Um, thanks everyone, that was a great discussion. We're gonna change it up and, and talk about adult uh, deformity. So my case is a 54 year old male. He presented to us with severe back and bilateral lower extremity pain. Um, he had uh, pain in his posterior thighs and uh, buttock area, uh, difficulty standing upright, and he failed conservative management. 
Of note, his past surgical history consisted of a lumbar decompression fusion performed three years prior at an outside hospital. Uh, neurologically, he was intact. Uh, his only real um, finding on physical exam was that he ambulated uh, hunched forward, uh, but with an otherwise steady gait. These are his uh, lateral uh, AP and lateral lumbar spine x-ray showing a previous instrumented fusion from L2 to 5. Uh, as you can see, there's a significant loss of lumbar lordosis uh, in addition to uh, some, some mild adjacent segment degeneration of his discs at L1, 2, and L5, 1. These are his flexion extension views demonstrating a, a rigid spine uh, with no evidence of pseudoarthrosis based on the lack of motion. Uh, we obtained uh, standing uh, scoliosis films, uh, which show uh, significant sagittal malalignment uh, with an SVA of eight centimeters. He also had a PILL mismatch of approximately 40 degrees um, with a pelvic tilt of 25. Uh, he obtained a CT myelogram uh, owing to his history of an ICD uh, placed uh, previously. Um, the CT confirmed uh, a good fusion from L2 to 5. Um, with adjacent segment uh, stenosis at L1, 2, and L5, 1. Um, so for this patient, uh, we really had two issues that we were trying to address. Uh, his neurologic, uh, his neurogenic claudication uh, with his bilateral leg pain in addition to his uh, deconditioning and his sagittal uh, malalignment. And so we uh, decided to address both at the same time. Um, the procedure that we performed was the removal of hardware of his previous uh, instrument diffusion. And then to address his uh, neurogenic claudication, we performed a laminectomy at L1-2 and L5-1. And then to address his deformity, we performed uh, posterior column osteotomies at L1-2 and L5-1, in addition to uh, posterior lumbar antibody fusion at L5-1 and then um, an L4 PSO in addition to an L1 to pelvis instrument infusion. And then these are his post-op uh, scoliosis standing x-rays, which show significant improvement in his PIL mismatch down to 11 degrees. SVA was uh, 5.1 centimeters. I do have a couple articles uh, that I just wanted to discuss that kind of goes off of a lot of what Dr. Ludwig presented already. Um, but these papers basically um, in an adult deformity po uh, population, um, look at, uh, sorry, this is a cat cadaveric model looking at L5S1 range of motion with the addition of uh, either pedicle screws and then pedicle screws in addition to iliac screws. And then also with ALFs in one group. And then one group had a uh, inner body uh, rod placed, basically is, a, is like a, kind of like a device that anchors uh, the two vertebral bodies together. And you can see here that the range of motion with the addition of iliac screws was significantly better when compared to just an ALF or compared to just pedicle screws alone. And then also the uh, stress on the S1 screw was also significantly less uh, with the addition of iliac screws uh, shown in the second table here. And then my other paper, interestingly, uh, you know, we discussed the role of SI fusion, uh, but this paper looked at long-term follow-up of patients that were instrumented to the pelvis and just looked at SI joint pain and these patients did not have a formal SI joint fusion. And you can see in the group that uh, did receive iliac screws, uh, they had significantly less SI joint pain at long-term follow-up. Yeah, so cool. Um, so maybe you can go to the um, post-op x-rays, bring them up for the parameters for discussion. I think, Jens, you had a, a question. You have your hand raised. <clears throat> yes, so this is a very instructive case and beautifully done. Can you, Dr. Patel, go back to the pre-op images? And maybe I can call upon the famous Dr. Lieberman, <clears throat> who may have a thing or two to say. Um, this is, again, just the bane of our existence as spine surgeons. So if we comment on this, and I'll just shut up here and have Dr. Lieberman unleash. Uh, this is, in part, an iatrogenically created problem. So I'll just shut up here and ask Izzy to, to uh, go live. Thank you, Jens. Always setting me up for success, are you? So, yeah, this clearly is an iatrogenic issue. If you look from the, the top of, what is that, 5, 4, 3, 2, down to S1, there's essentially zero lordosis. 
Uh, what we don't see on this film is what his pelvic inclination is and where his uh, hips and knees are lying right now, how much he's flexing uh, at the hips and knees to balance himself. But this is the, the classic flat back uh, diagnosis. Uh, as the years have gone by, I, I've become much more um, be a believer that no one is allowed to die without at least a spinal cord stimulator these days, because everybody seems to get a spinal cord stimulator. I, I don't know how a spinal cord stimulator is going to fix an iatrogenic flat back. So that's another issue with these things. And I'll just put this out there. We've now taken out a lot of these spinal cord stimulators, and 30% of them have an infected uh, pulse generator pouch. We've cultured them all. So we've got to be wary about it. I'm tired of being blamed for all the revision infections that I get, but most of the time they do have occult infections and watch out for those spinal cord stimulators. So in, in this one here, you've got to think of biomechanics. You've got to think of alignment. You've got to think of patient function. And, and it's a very complex situation. And you absolutely need to have some kind of foundation in order to support the superstructure. So there's no doubt that this is going to need something to the pelvis. And Steve mentioned earlier that there's still a lot to learn about pelvic fixation, SI joint fixation, SI joint pain, primary fusion or not. But over the last five to seven years, I've evolved to fusing the SI joint as an orthopedic principle. Uh, you don't want to violate that joint with screws. If you're only putting in one screw, even though it's just a jog of motion, it's you know less than a millimeter of motion, it's still moving and they still get pain and those screws do loosen over time. And yeah, we get great L5-S1 fusions, but you can look at a lot of long-term post-op CT scans and you can see the haloing around the leading edge of those screws in the iliac wing. So we've been revising those, pulling those out. Some patients do well, some don't do well. But in order to get the best fixation, it should be two points across the SI joint, primary fusion of the SI joint, and get the screws in a clinically non-prominent position, which is the S2AI or the modified approach that, that Steve had mentioned. Izzy, just for clarification, it may be a cool, you can go to the, the post-op x-rays, and, and Izzy really broke down this case beautifully uh, with regards to the creation of iatrogenic deformity and how we could fix it. And Izzy, just for clarification, because I think I did this case before we had a good understanding of, you know, the role of a concomitant SI joint fusion, and I share your same sort of thought process with regards to if you're crossing the joint, right, you might, you know, you, you probably are disrupting it and it's probably a source of discomfort and pain. Who knows? It's really hard, at least in my mind, to figure out whether or not the SI joint is a persistent cause of pain because you're violating the joint, right? It's hard to prove that, right? So you might as well treat it because it makes sense in theory and what we do and our hardware failure is just astronomically high, at least in our series, right? 25% of having a failure is just unacceptable with any technique. Even if patients are asymptomatic, a lot of them can see it's very from across the room when their head of the screw pulls out, when the screw shank breaks, when you don't do a fusion, when the rod becomes disengaged from the screw, right? That, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not a good thing, as you know. I guess my question, just for clarity's sake, when you do your technique, are you, in an open fashion, are you actually taking out the cartilage, putting a burr into the joint, packing the joint with any bone, or are you relying on the current state of implants to fuse across the joint, almost an onlay fusion as opposed to a true bony joint fusion. What is your thoughts on that? So I've evolved over time. I did do a lot of single screws across the SI joint, the S2 aleroiliac screws. Uh, 
And I ended up, and it was very predictable. Two and a half, three years later, I'm pulling out those screws. Uh, they just come and they they tell you, I've got pain rating to the front of my hip here and here. And I've got many of those cases that I've shown throughout. So with that, I then started uh, open decortication of that joint. So I'll resect the dorsosacral iliac joint ligaments. Yes, I do put a burr into the joint. And yes, I do pack the joint with bone graft. And I did that probably for about two years. It is difficult to do. The dissection is very difficult. You have to pay attention to it and it does increase the blood loss. There's absolutely no doubt about it. So then with the robotic technology, I started doing it a little less invasive and I put the screws across the SI joint with the S2 iliac screws. And then I'd take an eight millimeter drill and I would drill down the longitudinal axis of the joint. And then I would just pack that with bone graft. And that also worked well over time. I don't recall ever having to revise any of my opens or any of those. But another two years go by. Yeah, I hate to interrupt you, but just for clarification also, because we'll do a technique with the, with the Mazor, we'll plan a trajectory across the SI joint, drill and ream down it, put a funnel in and pack that joint. How do you decide on your planning trajectory? And this is where I think enabling technology really helps us a lot because the anatomy of certain SI joints, I mean, it's all over the place. Yeah. There's some morphology that's fairly straightforward and you can get a nice trajectory. There are other morphologies that are almost like an S shape where you can't get a really good decortication path. So how do you navigate through those different anatomic features of the SI joint? So with the pre-op planning software, looking at the CT scan in the axial, coronal, and sagittal planes, I just pick what I think is getting the best purchase on both cortices for the longest track I can get through that SI joint. Yep, got it. No. So I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Finish so your, your okay. process. So that's okay. So I did that for a couple of years and then got involved with the bedrock technique where we were placing the iFuse device from an inside out across the SI joint. Now, it's technically not really an SI joint fusion. It's SI joint fixation because we now know that it really doesn't fuse across the joint. What you're doing is you're getting bone ingrowth on both sides of the implant, which is fixating the joint. And that has now evolved. And we have, the, there's the Sylvia study that uh, a number of us were involved in and, and uh, we've collected cases. It's now uh, well into a year post collection where we're analyzing it. And that the results of that should be out next year in terms of morbidity and outcome and fail rates of S1 screws, S2 iliac screws, and all the parameters. But we've gone from the bedrock technique to what we're now calling the granite technique. And these are S2 iliac screws that have porous ingrowth features. They're very robust, very big screws. And my standard now is S1 iliac, S2 iliac, so stacked screw. So I'm getting two points of fixation across the sacroiliac joint, not necessarily a fusion. And this then leads to more less invasive, minimally invasive approaches, because you're not taking down that whole medial wall of the uh, ilium. You're not resecting the dorsal sacroiliac joint ligaments. And the beauty is you can line your screws up perfectly with your L5 screws and on occasion, if you've got someone, particularly some of the females, if you've got a broader pelvis, you can even still fit an S1 screw in, if you need an S1 sacral uh, pedicle screw, if you need to, with the S1 ailer iliac and the S2 ailer iliac screws. So it opens up a whole host of options for us to get the foundation to build the spine up and still maintain basic orthopedic principles across the sacral iliac joint. Yeah, phenomenal points. Great, great, great points. Thank you for, for that contribution. One last question, Izzy. Um, and then this is a good segue into Jeff Weinreb's case example as well. Um, when you're doing a 
quad rod, accessory rod, right? You're adding rods to your construct for stability. Are you also, are you using that fusion screw to hook up to your accessory rod? Or are you hooking up the rod to your standard, to one screw and just leaving the other screw as a fusion screw? Typically, I am trying to hook one rod to both the S1 aleriac and the S2 aleriac screws. Where I have used a quad rod technique or another accessory rod technique is essentially for my sacral tumors, uh, where the anatomy is just a little different. So I've got an iliac screw, I've got something, so I'll hook one rod up to the iliac screw, one rod to whatever piece of sacrum may be left that I can do an S2 aleriac. So you just adapt to it. And really, it's it's just carpentry, figuring out what you need to do to address the biomechanics, whether it's two rods, three rods, or four rods, I think it's irrelevant. Uh, you can cross-link them. There, there's so many things we can do. We've got so many tools right now. You just have to figure out how to piece the puzzle together, keep it low profile, and address the biomechanics to maintain stability. Got it. Yep. Thank you. So Jeff, you want to show the last case and we can use that as a segue to some more discussion points. Perfect, thanks. All right, uh, I'm Jeff Weinrab. Just wanted to thank everyone for having us, Seattle Science. Um, and my case here is a 65 year old female. She presented with severe low back and left greater than right leg pain. Uh, symptoms were intermittent over a number of years, uh, but worsening over the past one and a half years. Pain is primarily located in bilateral buttocks and down, down the bilateral thighs, worse with standing, and uh, non-responsive to conservative treatments, no prior spine surgery. And she does have a diagnosis of osteoporosis with a T-score of negative 3.2. Um, no tobacco or alcohol use, motor intact, and some minor diminished sensation, posterior right leg to her foot. And next slide. So here we have a AP lateral and flex X views, lumbar spine. Uh, you can see there's a grade three to four ismic spondy of uh, L4 or L5S1. Uh, no significant movement on flexion or extension views, um, and there's a no significant lumbar scoliosis. Um, you can see there's also fairly maintained disc spaces uh, at the levels above. Pelvic incidence was about 90 degrees, uh, and lumbar low doses was about 60 degrees. Go to the next slide. So here we have uh, T2 sagittal and axial images. Um, here, again, you can see the uh, spondylolisthesis L5-S1, and there's some L3-4 and L4-5 facet gapping. Uh, bilateral foraminal stenosis 4.5 and L5.1, and to some extent as well as uh, at L3.4. And then central stenosis 4.5, L5S1, and to a lesser extent, L3.4. And CT scan, um, axials and sagittal reconstructions, uh, shows there's an autofusion of L5S1 and spondylosis most severe at L5, uh, L5S1 and L4.5. So Jeff, why don't we, why don't we stop here um, before we show what, what we did in Maryland uh, for this, and maybe we can open it up to Jens, to Izzy, to Rick, Eugene, et cetera. Eugene, you know this case, so. Can, can I just yeah. ask again, what was this individual's principal complaint? Jeff, so, back in the room, right? Yep. Low, low back pain, but as well as uh, bilateral lumbar radiculopathy, posterior legs and buttocks running down the legs, left greater than right. So Izzy, the, the, the summary of this case is degenerative stenosis from L3 to S1, high grade spondylolisthesis. It looks like it's almost water fused, right? Yes, L5, yeah. S1. Um, in the face of osteoporosis. Uh, if I may say, this is a fantastic case with so many things. To help us understand this patient, is this patient psychosocially normal and well anchored and balanced? Are there things that we should think about? Because obviously kind of one thing fits to the other, fits the other, but uh, this is an extraordinarily difficult case and uh, either um, suggests neglected self-care or general neglect of some other sorts. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chapman. Actually, she was a fairly normal social individual, good support system, no major medical problems. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing, Jens, right? 
it, it never ceases to amaze me. This is a fascinating thing about spine amongst the many things is you can never predict from a preoperative image what a patient is like or looks like. I mean, it's, it's this patient could be writhing in pain and uh, incontinent and whatever. Obviously, it's a chronic condition. She schlepped herself through life with this uh, pretty gnarly looking spine. Could, so, so you just back to her MRI scan. Izzy, you asked, you shall receive. Yeah. I mean, do we have a quantified bone density like either um, ROI, uh, Hounsfield units, or a formal T-scan of the non-spine section? Yeah, what was her, her DEXA was negative 3.2, I think. Negative 3.2 was the spine. Um, I don't have the uh, non-spine. And one more time, how 65 years old, right? Yes. I mean, I'll just lurch or hit here in the interest of time. I would do a posterior decompression, including shaving off that posterior ugly S1 uh, conundrum. I would do nice retrograde Bowman type grafts. I would do an L4 to pelvis fusion or forget instrumentation attempts at L5. I'll just stop there and see uh, what others have to say, but I would not try a reduction. I would uh, just do a wide feminotomy isolating, skeletonizing here so well the L5 roots atraumatically and do a nice smooth uh, 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 shave off of the upper posterior end plate of S1 and seal that off with bone wax. Got it. Yeah, I, I don't know that L5 S1 is, is her problem to tell you the truth. That, that's a chronic issue. That's been like that for years and years and years. I think 4.5 is probably what's tipping her over the edge right now. Uh, I would not, I, it's auto-fused. There is absolutely zero indication to try to reduce that to do anything there. If you could, using selective nerve root blocks, convince yourself that the L5 nerve root or the S1 nerve root is contributing to her symptoms, then yeah, I would try to decompress those levels. Uh, but I think this is a 4-5 issue, maybe a little bit of stenosis at 3-4, uh, I would probably uh, look at realigning her four five a little bit from in front with an anterior interbody, and then depend and staging this, and depending on how she feels after that, decide whether you can just do perk screws at L four to S one because it's going to be hard to get anything into L five, or if you have to do something open or even decompress that three four level on her. But it's a, it's a complex case with a lot of decision points in the, in the road as you take her down that. Would yeah, anyone Dr. wait and Dr. treat her Dallas, osteoporosis? Any thoughts, uh, Rick, to, to uh, treating her osteoporosis prior to jumping in on surgery? Oh, yeah. You know, I think, you know, I would get her started on one of the, uh, one of the drugs to at least get her on the road to increasing her bone density because you're going to have a hard time. I mean, she is really osteoporotic. Her T-score is what, 3.2? So whether it's Forte or Timlos, and this is not an acute problem. It's a chronic problem. And the good news about these drugs, you know, we see that there's changes as early as three months. So I would get that on your side. And I agree with Izzy. I think L5S1 is autofused. And uh, <clears throat> I don't think that you're going to do anything with that. And with an ID fuse, just four, five, and three, four as well. That depends on, you know, what Izzy said in terms of trying to figure out where her symptoms are coming from. All great points. All great points. Um, Jeff, why don't you go through what we did in the rationale? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of things that we talked about. Um, so we can go to the operative details. Next couple slides. So we did treat her with six months of teriparatide. Uh, repeat T score was negative two point eight, so slightly better. Uh, and then we proceeded with surgical intervention, goals of wide central and foraminal decompression, focusing especially on L4-5, but kind of uh, across the board. Um, and then fusion to the pelvis to the pelvis to prevent a sacral fracture. Um, standard approach, um, wide exposure, L3 to sacrum. And then there were uh, transvertebral screws kind of in the Bowman technique uh, through L5-S1. And then uh, S2-AI screws placed bilaterally. And then yeah, these, so are just, so we, these are just views showing us on the notch. So we, we essentially did a combination of everybody's thoughts, right? Jens, um, his thoughts on transvertebral fixation, fixation in site two, 
added pelvic fixation to prevent, you know, the, the, the fracturing of the sacrum, you know, given her osteoporosis. Um, to Izzy's point, I think the main pain generators were coming from her stenosis and her retrolysis and her severe stenosis from the four or five region and three, four area. Um, she corrected some of her, um, um, some of her alignment by just positioning her on the table. And to Rick's point, we, we, we thought that um, the Forteo use would help with regards to her bone quality, um, you know, and getting that up and, and putting her in a better position to, to get this thing healed. Um, Okay, yeah, Jeff, you have a couple more concluding slides before we end? Yeah, one, one more slide. We have the most recent follow-up. Um, this was one-year follow-up. And she actually had a DEXA scan three months ago from today. And uh, it was uh, negative 2.0 at the hip. So, you know, we are treating, treating her osteoporosis, preventing fragility fractures, um, and she has a solid fusion. So, and her, her pain is, is improved. She's having some right hip pain. You can see there is some degeneration on that, um, on that AP there, but overall doing much better. Um, and then, and then a couple of studies, uh, I just thought it was an interesting question about what to treat patients with. If you're treating osteoporosis, we can go through this quickly. This is a study out of Japan. They looked at teriparatide, bisphosphonates and control in one, two level fusions and teriparatide or PTH had uh, less loosening at 12 months, so statistically significantly. Um, and the next slide. Um, and then one of the things we discussed is preventing sacral fractures. Uh, this is a, a case series as well as a meta-analysis and review the literature that looked at um, sacral fractures after short segment fusions. And one of the common uh, preoperative risk factors was decreased bone mineral density as expected. And then these are often treated with revision to the pelvis. These patients do well. So it is a salvage option as well in patients with uh, sacral fracture. Excellent. So thanks, Jeff. So, so yeah, I think this is a a really interesting topic, right? The techniques have evolved over the past several years, right? We're modifying the techniques. We're trying to make them better through minimal access surgery, through robotic and enabling technology. I think the role, as Izzy pointed out, for adding an SI joint fusion is, is sort of growing in interest. Um, um, any other last um, minute thoughts or comments? Um, Izzy, Jens, or Rick, or Eugene? The, the only other comment I would add, particularly with that last case, is cement. I probably would have cemented her screws in place, uh, maybe even the one above. You got away with it. You can't argue with success. But uh, I've become much more liberal in cement augmentation of my screws. Great point. Great point. I agree. Um, well, I want to thank everybody. I think we come to sort of the end of, of, of this session. Um, I want to thank Seattle Foundation once again for allowing us to present these cases. And I want to wish everybody happy, healthy holidays, happy Thanksgiving. And, and thank you, Steve. Those are all great cases. And thank your fellows and all the staff. Sure. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Good job. Have a great holiday, Bye -bye. everyone. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great holiday. You too. Thank you very much. Feel better.